welcome back everybody so in this video lecture we're going to be discussing uh, some of the work of Karl Marx and particularly Karl Marx's Das Kapital uh, this is not meant as a definitive presentation of Marx's work uh, it is not uh, it, it, we're just going to hit some of the highlights um, as it were. So let's hop in and talk about that. Okay, so Marx, of course, lived and wrote in the mid 19th century. Uh, so he passed away in 1883, uh, long before uh, the the Russian Revolution and the eventual creation of the Soviet Union, uh, long before the uh, rule of the Communist Party, beginnings of the rule of the Communist Party in China, uh, and, and, and really generations before uh, any of the sort of 20th century socialist regimes that, that um, you know, those of us living in the 21st century are much more familiar with. Marx is also the last classical economist. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that he's the last major economist to utilize the core methods and approaches uh, that really started with Adam Smith. Um, builds through David Ricardo and Robert Malthus and then John Stuart Mill, uh, and then we get to Marx. Uh, after Marx's time, economics takes a pretty significant turn. And so what we're going to see in Marx is uh, we're going to see an economic theory that's really built upon Ricardian ideas. If you're interested more in the ideas of David Ricardo, I have a whole series of video lectures on on David Ricardo, who, who was obviously an exceptional economist on his own. Okay, so let's hop into these first few ideas about Marx. When Marx speaks of commodities, he he means essentially what what we would mean today, right? That is things that we buy and sell. So this little puffy guy. Puffy guy here, commodity, right? It's clippers, commodity, things in the background, commodities. Okay. Marx wanted to started with this idea of commodity because it is in these commodities that we see the basis for all economically based social interaction. In other words, in terms of economy, commodities are how we come together suppliers of commodities meet demanders of commodities in the marketplace. And so the commodity as the focal point of that interaction is uh, in Marxian reasoning, the doorway into uh, understanding uh, economics and economic relationships. Now the problem that, that Marx, why he starts with commodity is first for the reason I just mentioned that it's central to all economic activity but second, uh, the second reason why Marx starts with the idea of the commodity is that commodity transactions in a capitalist economy, so our economy or, or virtually every other modern economy, reveal money prices. In other words, I bought this thing for so much money, right? I sold this thing for so much money as opposed to the things that Marx actually wanted to look at, which is underlying social relationships. So we have observed data in the form of money prices that does not fully reveal a series of social relationships that Marx felt were fundamental to understanding economic activity. Now, before we dig in too deep, one has to remember that, that well, maybe not remember, but understand that All the classical economists uh, wrote in maybe more dramatic, maybe excepting Ricardo, <laughs> wrote in more dramatic terms than economists would write today. And Marx is maybe one of the most dramatic. Uh, indeed, in my opinion, most of the misunderstandings of Marx, which are legion <laughs> in society, uh, come from reading the drama too closely and not reading the underlying economic ideas carefully enough. And so I hope that actually in this video series of lectures that, that I'm able to help you to do that, to sort of strip away the drama of Marx and get right down to uh, the economics of Marx. Okay. So 
what Marx is getting at, you know, we're just going to leave this. What Marx is getting at uh, in all this is that, first of all, labor is the basis for all value. Okay, so this is why um, money prices uh, are important to understand, but really don't tell us about social relationships. Labor costs or a simple Ricardian labor theory value can't explain prices. Okay, so when we look at money prices, it doesn't explain uh, underlying labor inputs very effectively. And so we need to look past these to real conditions of production. And again, to anybody who's studied classical economics for a while, this really shouldn't be that surprising because all classical economists is based upon real economic activity. Um, in, indeed, most modern microeconomics is also based on real economic activity. And for those of you who haven't studied economics, when economists talks about real economic activity, it's not real as opposed to fake. What economists mean by it is real as in terms of tangible transactions rather than monetary transactions. So for example, the real, my real wage is the things that I can buy with my wages. Okay. Real prices over our time are adjusted for inflation, which is something we see done all the time, right? So people say like, this was the price of this thing in 1971. Well, that's this much today. Okay, well, they're making an adjustment to try to capture the idea of real um, values. Okay, so Marx is, Marx is saying that, yeah, there's these nominal values out there, but that really doesn't tell us the story, so we need to look past them. It just, he does it in very dramatic terms, right? Okay, <clears throat> so what is this problem? So Mar Marx goes on and says, you know, this is a big problem because we see all these money prices and uh, they're, they're not really telling us the story of what's going on. Okay, Marx refers to this idea as a commodity fetish. That is particularly seeing things as having value, so like this clipper again is having value when Marx is saying no it's not the clipper that has value it's the people who built the clipper put value into it and the people who will use the clipper will absorb value okay so the value is not the clipper the value is the processes of construction and utilization all right now you know, here I have a picture of a tree, right, in the sort of first year, first semester philosophy question that, you know, always gets kicked around. If a tree falls in the woods and no one is there to hear it, does it make any sound? Okay, so, of course, the philosophical point of this is, does, do, do physical objects have meaning outside of their, um, outside of experience, human experience, lived human experience? And of course, then you can spend hours and hours kicking it back and forth, right? Well, well of course, a tree makes sound, right? Well, yeah, but does it, what does it mean if nobody, right? Okay, right? So Marx is essentially making the same point that the meaning of value, okay, the meaning of value is not the thing. It's the human creative experience and utilization experiences that matter, okay? So the misunderstanding of that, of looking at prices and value as being embedded in objects is commodity fetishism. Okay, sounds very dramatic, sounds kind of scary. One read commodity fetish, right? All kinds of things come to mind, but actually a pretty basic idea. Okay. All right, another early term that Marx uses or early on in Das Kapital, right? And that, that are foundational to uh, understanding his his sort of story, explain, way of explaining economic activity is this idea of reification. Okay, reification is the socialization process by which we come to see values embedded in objects. So reification is Marx's way of explaining why we're all so confused about these values. Uh, <laughs> all right, so the cat's back. <laughs> okay. So reification is the reason why we're all confused about values, right? And we, we have these commodity fetishes, fetishes and we see values as being embedded by commodities rather than in these underlying uh, social processes. Okay, so just remember that. You hear that term reification? That's what it means.
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so let's start digging in a little further. Okay. So, you know, why is it? What's the specifics? So why is this commodity fetishism a problem? Why do we need to have a process of reification? <laughs> All right. You want to come up here? All right. See, this is the white fuzz. See if I pet him, then he gets he's all happy. All right, all right here you're you're causing the video to not uh, function properly. Okay, so you know how can we how in more more straightforward terms how can we see past this? Well, you know, Marx recognized that a simple Ricardian style labor theory of value just wasn't going to cut it, right? So we'll recall that you know if we go back a couple generations in economic thought. Uh, you know, you have these sort of explanations of value uh, that say things like, well, you know, this item costs twice as much as this item in the marketplace because it took twice as long to make this as this. Okay. All right. This is obviously an extremely rudimentary way of thinking about value. Um, you know, by Marx's time, not, not just Marx, but economists in general were, were well aware that, that this really wasn't going to cut it. Um, because, of course, people can make things that that nobody wants, right? If I, I mean, there's a bunch of leaves in my backyard right now. I could, you know, scoop them up and make into a sculpture of Snoopy or something like that. But, you know, nobody wants my badly made leaf sculpture of Snoopy, even though it's going to take me a long time to make. Okay, so it's not going to have any market value. Similarly, of course, some people are more productive than others. You know, professional artists might actually be able to make a statue out of Snoopy. In less time that people might actually want. Um, in other words, it's not going to take every worker the exact same amount of time to make a given amount of widgets. Okay, so it's obviously not going to be the case that just because a given item has twice the labor input as another that it's going to have twice the price. So, uh, you know, Marx was well aware of that, and you know, a lot of times people will will sort of criticize labor theory of value or, or Marx or Mill or, or other economists on those grounds and say, well, obviously this can't be right. Well, yeah, those people haven't read any of those authors because they were all well aware of that. But they had this more complicated philosophical problem to deal with, and Marx does too. So Marx wished, so Marx recognized that there was this problem, right? But also recognized that he wanted to stick to the philosophical idea that all value is created by people. Okay, so why does anything have any value? It's because you know people made it so, <laughs> uh, which implies some kind of labor theory of value, right? Okay, so how does Marx remedy these ideas, conflicting ideas? Okay, enter socially necessary labor time. If you're starting to get the idea that wow, this is like this is kind of like Ricardo, but way more complicated. Yep, you're getting it. Uh, this is Marx is simply a way way up gamed Ricardian explanation of economy. All right, so socially necessary labor time. What is it? It's the amount of time needed by the average individual to produce a given commodity sold in the market. All right, so if we think of a thing of a clipper, right? It isn't just the labor that went into it. It's the amount of labor that went into the thing that was authorized by the marketplace. So society is making choices through the consumption of commodities about what type of labor is authorized in a, in a market sense and what labor isn't. So this thing sold and so the amount of labor that went into it is socially necessary. My leaf sculpture of Snoopy did not sell for any positive price, and so the entire labor that went into it was simply not socially necessary. Okay, so what we're concerned with is the labor values necessary to produce items that created saleable commodities. Okay, all right, great. Socially necessary labor time. All right. Another key component of this of this sort of fundamental or foundation of Marxian economics 
is the idea of use value and exchange value. Another thing that should not be unfamiliar to students of classical economics. All the classical economists, Smith, Ricardo, Mill, etc., all made this distinction between use values and exchange values. It's not until we get to the modern economy, you know, modern economic era, the post-classical era, that we start to see um, utility-based value. Um, that's again not not part of this. So when Marx talks about use values, he's using those words a little bit differently than other classical economists, but certainly in the same general vein. Use values in Marx are the degree to which a, a given commodity can be utilized in production. So it, it's, it could be, right, a good could be an investment good, like a drill press or a lathe or a teaching station, <laughs> right, and have a use value because it can be utilized in future production. Or it can fulfill a human need, like, you know what, a pound of corn or something like that can be used to eat, right? So it has a use value. Use values in general speak to the real properties of a commodity. So the drill press can be used to make these things. Okay, the lathe can be used to make those things. The food can be eaten to keep this physical person alive. In all these cases, use values speak to physical properties. Okay. Exchange values, on the other hand, are the ratio at which commodities will exchange for each other. So the ratio at which the clipper exchanges for the little puffy. <laughs> okay, so maybe two of these or two of these gets you one of these. I don't know. Okay, that's the exchange value of commodity for commodity. So exchange value is essentially a barter idea. Okay. Now you might say, well, what about prices? Are prices exchange value? Prices and marks are a particular kind of exchange value. They are the ratio at which the commodity will exchange for another specific commodity, namely money. Okay, so I'll say that again. Exchange values in marks are the rate ratio at which two things will exchange, essentially a, rate, a set of barter value ratios. Prices are a specific type of barter exchange. It's simply the price of a commodity in terms of money, another commodity, okay? Some of you might be saying, well, don't some economists speak of money as not a normal commodity? Yes, including Marx, right? So this is one of those areas where Marx is gonna, gonna kind of go, well, it's this, and then it's, no, but it's that too. Okay, so for now, for now, money is simply another commodity very much like how we studied it in the video on Say's Law, where we introduced a set of commodities and then introduced an additional commodity that was money that introduced another equation and a system of equations. Okay, that's, so, so, so far we're straight up Ricardian sort of stuff. All right, back. <laughs> <clears throat> so to summarize what we've learned so far, e economic activity is a series of interactions. The commodity is the focal point of the interactions. Two, all value comes from labor, people, not things. Okay, right? Prices, which we can observe, do not convey value, right? Value is about embedded use values, okay? Or, or even exchange values. Prices are just one specific type of exchange value. All right, so what we observe in terms of money prices and the prices at which goods and services exchange hands, uh, not super meaningful. They're going to tell us some things, but they're not going to tell us the things that Marx wants to investigate. Okay, why does it matter? It matters because society only has so much labor. Socially necessary labor must be rationed. Okay, so we, you know, everybody could devote their time to making leaf sculptures of Snoopy to continue the analogy earlier, uh, and then we would have nothing that anybody wants. Okay. Uh, so socially, so labor is scarce, and we therefore as a society need to allocate it in such a way that we produce socially necessary uh, output with our socially necessary labor. And if we utilize a capitalist system to do so, in other words, so if, the, if money prices determine what gets produced, Marx says that it will be profit that determines what gets produced. And, and indeed, that's essentially what conventional microeconomics today says. Marx says this is a problem because money prices do not necessarily correspond to use values in the form of human needs and physical capital accumulation. In other words, if we look at money prices to direct uh, uh, physical 
labor uh, will end up producing the wrong things. Okay, so that's enough for this time. We'll end it there. We'll see you next time, everybody. Take care. <laughs>